But is this new dragonfly still as relevant and still as impressive as those that came before it? Let's start with the box. Um, the packaging for the Dragonfly Cobalt is, well, it's quite disappointing if I'm honest. The box itself is nice, I suppose, but the way the Cobalt and its accompanying accessories are packaged within the box is rather cheap. It pretty much reminds me of the type of packaging used on Fire's old M3 player, which costs a mere $50, and that's nowhere near the asking price of the Cobalt. In the box, we get the Cobalt, as well as a little protective pouch. I must admit that whilst I really like the idea of this pouch, in real world usage it can be quite annoying to use. It fits really snugly, which obviously helps to ensure that the cobalt remains securely protected, but when you want to remove the cobalt, it can be quite fiddly. If you place it with the protective cap facing upwards, then you inevitably end up pulling the cap off first and then having to remove the cobalt by pulling on the USB connector. Likewise, if you place it with the cap facing downwards, you don't really have anything to grip onto when you want to remove it, and the glossy finish really isn't helping either. In this manner, you'll most likely end up getting the cobalt out, but then the cap will still remain in the pouch. At first glance, and especially to those who don't know what a dragonfly is, the cobalt and indeed all of the other dragonfly models simply looks like a regular, albeit perhaps slightly fat, USB thumb drive. Measuring in with a length of 57mm, a width of 19mm, and a maximum thickness of 12mm, the Cobalt is an extremely compact USB DAC device. In fact, it's even 5mm shorter than either the Dragonfly Black or Red which came before it. There are a couple of other design changes too, compared to the Cobalt's predecessors. The overall profile is less boxy and more curvaceous, and that metallic blue color shimmers quite a bit when the light hits it. There really isn't a great deal that we can talk about, other than perhaps the unassuming 3.5mm single-ended connection and the little dragonfly, which lights up in different colors depending on what kind of sample rate is being fed to the device. Those differing colors aren't particularly useful per se, but I suppose it functions as a confirmation that whatever track is being played on the source device is being properly fed to the Cobalt. AudioQuest claims that the Cobalt has been pretty much redesigned compared to the black and red models which came before it. The deck chip has been upgraded to a Sabre ES9038Q2M, and they have opted for the minimum phase slow roll-off digital filter this time round. However, perhaps a more important upgrade is the new PIC32MX247 microcontroller, which apparently requires less current while still being able to offer 33% faster processing speed as compared to the PIC32MX270 used in both the black and red models. That reduction in current draw is especially important for this type of device when we consider the fact that none of the Dragonfly models have a built-in battery. That is, when you connect it to another device, it is that other device which powers the Dragonfly. For a desktop computer, this is never a problem, but when we consider connecting the Dragonfly to a laptop or smartphone which is being powered by a battery, then we can start to see why connecting something like a Dragonfly is not particularly ideal, as the Dragonfly would slowly drain the host device's battery. So reducing the current draw requirement for the Cobalt was a great move by AudioQuest. You will also notice that there are no volume buttons on the Cobalt, and indeed the same is true for all of the Dragonfly models. What this means is that the only way you can control the volume is by using the volume control of the host device that you are connecting the Cobalt to. This is another area which isn't ideal from both a practical and sound quality standpoint. Ideally, the more volume steps you have, the more finely you can control the volume output. But if we are talking about a device like a mobile phone, then you usually only have around 15 or 16 volume steps. This means that going from one volume step to the next can result in a pretty big jump in volume, especially if you are using high sensitivity IEMs. In addition, if we consider what this means to the sound quality, you don't really get all of the music unless you have the volume set at its maximum. Because it's digital volume control, by lowering the volume you are actually cutting out bits of data, rather than just lowering the volume. It's actually partly for this exact reason that iFi created the EarBuddy, 
And speaking of, the Cobalt does produce a fair amount of hiss from the output, but you only really notice this with high sensitivity IEMs, so I would strongly recommend using the EarBuddy with the Cobalt for such IEMs. Well, I suppose that leads us on to the sound of this little device, and I think the first thing I should mention is the surprising amount of power that the Cobalt can deliver. One thing to understand about driving headphones is that the bass frequencies require the most amount of power. Low frequency sound waves have much longer wavelengths, and as such the audio amplifier has to sustain a certain amount of power for a bass note considerably longer than for a higher frequency. So usually, if you don't have enough power, it will be the bass that suffers, but the Cobalt has no such problem here. Honestly, the HD58X might not be super hard to drive, but they still do seem to benefit from a more powerful amplifier to sound their best, and with the Cobalt, I simply found no need to increase the volume more than about 9 or 10 steps out of 15 on my Nokia 7.1 using the Fire Music app. But that only tells us about how loud the Cobalt can drive headphones. That is no indication of actual sound quality. As I mentioned, with reference to the iFi EarBuddy, ideally you will want your digital volume to always be at a maximum to ensure that all of the digital bits are being used. But an important thing to ask here is whether or not those lost bits is something you will truly notice. In my experience, this will depend on your listening environment and the volume level you are listening at. If you are using the device in a portable scenario, then the chances are that you will have external sounds interfering with the music in such a manner that it will make it more difficult for you to really hear those differences anyways. But if you are in a quieter environment and listening to lower volume levels, then I often find that this at least gives me the impression that something is missing, if I compare it to a device which has an analog volume control. So yes, it can matter, but whether it actually will or won't is dependent on how you will use the device. Having said that, the Cobalt should still be commended for the fantastic sound quality it can achieve from such a small and convenient form factor, regardless of the effect that the reliance on digital volume control can have. The fact is, you absolutely can have the Cobalt be your only high quality music device. You can pretty seamlessly use it as a DAC for your PC, then unplug it and hook it up to your mobile phone when you head out the door. The truth here is that the Cobalt allows you to take a device which can give you really high quality sound pretty much anywhere you want to go. In fact, the difference in sound quality between the Cobalt and more expensive and much larger external DACs is actually so small that it really makes you wonder whether the inconvenience of such a bigger device is truly worth it. The overall value of the Cobalt is a little tricky because we need to take into account all of the features, or the lack thereof. You see, whilst the Cobalt does indeed sound great, and it can provide you with a really impressive amount of power for even some of the most demanding headphones, and in a seemingly minute form factor, the fact is that the Cobalt also does not really offer a great deal of features or functionality. If we compare it to something like Fios Q5 and the newer Q5S, the Cobalt doesn't give you the option of swappable amp modules or even Bluetooth connectivity, and yet the original Q5 comes with the same price tag as the Cobalt, whereas the Q5S is just $50 more. Of course, none of that matters if you have no need for those features, and neither of the Q5 models can even hope to compete with just how compact the Cobalt is. However, there is one particular flaw with the Cobalt which really does annoy me. Let's just remind ourselves that the Cobalt is the most expensive mini USB DAC from AudioQuest and it comes with a price increase of $100 over that of the Dragonfly Red. So what is it that annoys me? Well, it's rattle. You see, if you wiggle the USB connector, you can actually feel all of the insides move, and you can see it on the headphone connector too. Even if you just shake it, you can hear it rattling. To me, it just feels wrong to charge people $300 for this device, but then to have very little effort put into properly securing everything down. 
$300 is a premium price tag for this type of device and as such I would expect it to have a premium build quality as well. There really is no excuse for this type of laziness or ineffective quality control. Heck, even the sub $40 Zishan Z2 doesn't even have the slightest bit of rattle to it. This might seem like it's no big deal to some or perhaps even most people, but to me it says a lot about how a company views their own products. The cheap packaging and then this rattle, that doesn't exactly give me any impression that AudioQuest is proud of their creation. And if they are not proud of it, well then why should any person looking to own one be? It really is such a shame because other than that, I think the Cobalt is a pricey but really great product nonetheless as far as the performance goes. For what it is intended for, I really cannot think of another product which offers the same combination of audio quality, compact form factor and power output. So having said that, if the Argo 